I'm now absolutely delighted to invite uh, Ilse Trunix up. Uh, she will be the moderator for the next panel. Um, we are going to invite um, Honorable Derek Daly, uh, Natural Resources in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, uh, come on, please come up and join us. Uh, um, I had the great privilege of uh, sitting across from Diane McQueen last night, the Minister of Energy uh, from Alberta. She's a pistol and uh, uh, she's making things happen. Uh, the uh, Marie uh, um, Andrew Younger couldn't make it. He had a there was a, an issue with the legislature, but Marie Kulikin, who's a de uh, deputy minister of Energy of Nova Scotia, and uh, he is uh, going to be taking his place. And uh, uh, I have worked with this uh, gentleman and know how capable he is. So over to you, Ilse. Thanks very much, Annette, and uh, thank you, everybody. I think we have a pretty interesting opportunity, not too much time to wrap up this final conversation. So uh, what I suggest is I'm going to give each of our panelists just a few minutes to give us uh, whatever observations they would like to give us and maybe lob a, a question at each of them. And then I really want us to open the floor so that you have a chance to uh, get those last questions in before we wrap up. And I know some people have to get plain, so we promise we'll get you out of here at 5 o'clock. Um, so Minister Daly, would you like to start and just give us a Thank few a few perspectives from Newfoundland and Labrador. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, certainly a pleasure to be here and uh, being relatively new in the energy sector. Um, I look forward to this opportunity today and I'm going to be honest, it's not about what I wanted to say or bring to you. It's more about what I can get from you. And I, I'd have to say it's your most enjoyable day and congratulate Pre Premier Wynne on uh, obviously having the vision to bring this together. It's been an incredible day. Um, you know, and again, as Newfoundland and Labrador being a, a key part of developing the Canadian energy strategy, um, you know, I, I guess in government, lots of times, the easiest thing that we do is to identify problems. We hear it every day. But the real challenge is find solutions. How do we find those solutions? And, and when I sit here today, I got, I, got to, I got to tell you, I think it's been incredible that, you know, we have challenges in the energy sector without question but there's a lot of solutions in this room. It's been a tremendous amount of work and dedication and, and people have committed a lot of time and effort and money to find those solutions and it's encouraging. In Newfoundland and Labrador, we have our own challenges as well. We went out and found a solution in Muskrat Falls. In uh, December 2012, uh, Government of Newfoundland and Labrador sanctioned a game-changing project for Newfoundland and Labrador and what we believe be for the East Coast, certainly in terms of Nova Scotia, our partners. And when we sanction Muskrat Falls, it's 824 megawatts of hydroelectricity. From there, we will develop 1,100 kilometer Labrador Island link, transmission link, moving the island of Newfoundland from an isolated option, dependent on fossil fuels, to an integrated system, as well a maritime link, 180 subsea, 180 kilometer subsea cable that will link our system to Nova Scotia and onward through New Brunswick and down into the New England states. Tremendous project, but again, it's certainly it's a game changer for us, but when we look at the national perspective of where we're, we're all sharing a common goal, a common goal of renewable energy, reliable, dependable, clean, efficient, then we're delighted to be able to contribute to that and certainly play a role. What Muskrat Falls will do for us in hydroelectric power, it enables us to write a new story, a new chapter. We'll link to North America's electricity grid, we'll end dependence on oil and price volatility, we'll have tremendous economic benefits for Newfoundland and Labrador, the Atlantic region, and indeed Canada. Our economy will be fueled by 98% sustainable energy. Reliable, reliability will be added, redundancy, There'll be economic benefits, all done with an environmental and social lens. We developed our energy plan in 2007, and we moved from there. We've developed our energy resources. It's ongoing. We have surplus power that we'll, we'll sell. We've entered into partnership with Amera of Nova Scotia. And what it's done is provided, at least on our end, an opportunity for competitive advantage, an opportunity for economic development. And when I sit... Today, and I listen to 
all of you share your experiences and your thoughts, especially around research and opportunities and what's out there. I think we've identified challenges, but I get a strong sense from all of you, you've identified opportunities as well. You've found solutions. One of the things, I guess, that we would bring as well to the Canadian energy strategy, and it was mentioned here today, and I think it's important that we recognize one of our largest challenges are those communities that are off-grid. Reference today, Ramy is a small island off Newfoundland and Labrador, and uh, we've gone into a, a special project of wind, hydrogen, and diesel, where uh, you know we're doing a pilot, some research, and we're having incredible success, where there's a new monitoring system which will automatically dispatch the, uh, the different sources of generation. And so far we've seen where in Ramia alone, uh, there's been a savings of 750,000 liters of diesel. And it's been referenced here today as how are we gonna beat diesel? And this is just one example that's happening in the province. Um, and, I, and, and sitting here today, and I know you want a reference about how I felt about today. Do you know, I think we all recognize we all have strengths. All of our provinces have strengths. We're all competitive, there's no question about that. But we all have strengths in the energy sector. There's incredible research and innovation and technology. And I think inherent in everything that we talked about today, there are common goals. Common goals of clean, renewable energy, low cost energy, sustainable, reliability. These are the buzzwords that we're hearing and we're all trying to reach that common goal and different ways of doing that. One of the things that I think a comment that was just made earlier is about partnering for results. We find ways to partner. We all have a role to play. And as we move through and develop this energy strategy and Newfoundland and Labrador will certainly do its part, but we need to listen to what's being said today. The importance of partnership, the importance of communication, the importance of collaboration. You know, sometimes these things are, you know, we dismiss those and we look for the complex answers. Well, a lot of times I think we need to go back to more simple approach in terms of collaboration, partnership, and communication. If we can find that right mix and we can develop that, then we can create the opportunities that all of you talked about today, whether it's here domestically, which I firmly believe we need to take care of our domestic needs, grow our economies here, create the opportunities here, but in doing so, it enables all of you to grow your business, grow your, your contributions to the economy of our country, but as well, obviously, globally, then to get out and share all that you do. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. I've certainly learned lots today. Delighted to have the opportunity. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Minister Daly. And uh, so, Minister McQueen, if I, if I think about us being serious about embedding innovation into the the Canadian energy strategy. Uh, clearly, none of that's gonna happen without leadership from Alberta. So, so where are we at and what should we do? I'm very much looking forward to your perspectives. Excellent, well, thank you very much and thank you for hosting uh, this session, panel session. And I really want to uh, thank uh, Premier Wynne and the whole team from Mars here for putting this on that we could come together. I think you've done a fantastic job showing the leadership here. And as I was saying to you last evening and earlier today uh, with the media, when Premier Redford, uh, our Premier from Alberta, brought forward the discussion uh, a year and a half, two years ago, about a Canadian energy strategy, it was in a way that we could actually, as, as provinces and territories and as a nation, to start talking about what's important uh, globally, uh, the energy supplier from all aspects that we have in each of our provinces and territories, and we are a real global supplier of energy uh, for, for others. And we have uh, such a different variety of energy sources. And so it's what I've seen from that is now when we have leadership, uh, Premier Wynne, with you now bringing this and encouraging the conversation here today in Toronto and, and other premiers and ministers as well, really says to us, uh, the Canadian energy strategy is really an important uh, strategy. It talks about how do we um, make sure that whatever the energy source that we have and are using, that we're all working to make that greener and to make that cleaner. And it really talks about everything that we have in this nation because we truly are blessed across the nation with abundant resources. And so when we look at the work that we're doing, and I think when you, with your question about the innovation is so important, 
And that is something that Alberta has always looked at very seriously. When we look at the innovation between, um, I, Eddie Isaacs is here from Alberta Innovates. Eddie, thank you for being here. The work that Climate Change Emissions Management Corp is doing with the funds that we collect um, um, from our emitters. And then of course, uh, the work that you heard earlier today with COSIA, uh, amazing to have that many CAOs come together and start sharing information so that we can really uh, have uh, new technologies and innovation in technologies to green our barrels, to, to uh, clean and to move to renewables as well. And certainly the work, we're blessed uh, with great uh, universities and colleges in our province um, that are working with us in so many areas to move uh, to uh, greener technologies as well. And so I think that's what's been really important. But also about this is really hearing, um, uh, having uh, elected officials here, but more importantly, I think all of you that have been here and presented today, but even the conversations that we have uh, and conversations like today but elsewhere um, really help us come together and talk about what is the future of energy in Canada in all of our provinces and what is the future of energy globally and as we have that technology I think of the uh, carbon capture and storage uh, dollars that we have put to 1.4 billion dollars into technologies uh, to reduce emissions in that area that'll be something that will be extremely important to share those projects as they commercialize with the world when I was in Warsaw a few months ago, um, uh, that was really something we talked about now. We've got 21 projects that will be moving to commercialization just in CCS. When you look at the innovation uh, and the amount of dollars that all of us collectively are putting towards that, it says to all of us that uh, uh, we have a lot uh, to do, a lot of work to do, but we have a lot of work as a nation and as provinces and territories to offer the world and to be able to uh, invest in technology and innovation, but to make sure that we also are sharing that with the world. So I really look forward to uh, the discussion here today, but I really want to thank all the panelists. I think it's been a, a great day, and thank you for having us. Thanks very much. Um, Deputy Minister Coolian, you, you know the space cold. Um, give us the, the, the Nova Scotia perspective on the day and where we go next. Uh, well, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Premier Wynne and, and the people here at Mars who have organized this. It's been, it's been a great day. Uh, uh, my, uh, my minister is someone who mm. was, uh, was not just appointed Minister of Energy, he actually lives, uh, breathes, and sleeps energy. In fact, I wish he would sleep a little bit more. Uh, uh, he would have absolutely loved today. He, he would have eaten it. Up. I mean, I've enjoyed it, but he would be, uh, he would be jumping off the ceiling at the moment uh, because he, he really believes in innovation in the energy sector and looking at new ways of, of, uh, uh, of providing energy and looking at the upper economic opportunities that, that come from that. So it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't here. Um, there is a risk to innovation, and uh, uh, a lot of people have talked about it in the private sector. When you're in government, it's, it's worse. It's, it's like being a deputy minister and being asked to speak on a panel of ministers. That's, <laughs> it's highly risky, uh, <laughs> especially when you've dropped your text and you're not, you're not you're not following that anymore. So uh, in innovation is difficult. And one of the things that, and today has proven this out, that often when we talk about innovation, we're talking about the private sector and we're talking about technology. But I think one of the things that we miss is the need for innovation in government to help make all of this work. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was going to be a new thought for the day, but mm -hmm. Premier Selinger, uh, I think, did an excellent job uh, in talking about innovation in the Manitoba government, uh, things that they've done uh, differently. Uh, and I, uh, one of the reasons I love being in energy is that uh, in the government, it gives me an opportunity to innovate perhaps a little bit more than if I was the Deputy Minister of Education or, or, or Health. It's a very exciting, exciting area. I want to talk... Uh, give you one or two examples about innovation in, in Nova Scotia and primarily driven through the, through the government. I just want to talk first about context uh, because some of that's important. Uh, a number of uh, the Premier uh, Selinger talked about getting to 98% renewable uh, or being at 98% renewable with uh, electricity. And uh, Minister Daly talked about with uh, Muskrat Falls they will be at 96 98% too. 
So Nova Scotia has a target of reaching 40% renewables by uh, 2020. You're thinking, well, they're not in the game. What's, what's going on here? But you have to remember that our starting point a number of years ago was 10% renewables. So we, we have set a target of four times what we were doing when we set the target. And our coal uh, use was up around 75, 80% uh, when we started this process. And by 2020, we expect to be down around 25, 30% uh, coal. So uh, when we're talking about the provinces, it's important to remember the, the, uh, the context where people are starting uh, from and what resources they have to, to begin with. A big important part of our transformation is the Muskrat Falls project, and, and Minister Daly has talked about that. Uh, I would just say that it is very easy to underestimate the amount of time, energy, and goodwill that was required to come to an agreement between two governments and two corporations. One, a crown corporation, which is a little easier for them to manage, and for us, a private corporation that obviously we couldn't, uh, we couldn't manage. But uh, it was very com complex and required a tremendous amount of, uh, of goodwill. And I think it's an example of the kinds of things we need to do across the country. Premier Seliger talked about the relationship between Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure there will be further conversations among the, the provinces about that. Uh, in terms of innovation, the issue of Aboriginal people was referenced uh, today. We have a program called the Community Feed-In Tariff for Small-Scale uh, Renewables. And uh, I was at a meeting yesterday and learned that, that um, within a couple of years, uh, the Aboriginal people in Nova Scotia will be producing through these Community Feed-In Tariff projects as much, if not more, energy than they consume in the, in the province. So they will become self-sufficient. Uh, through our uh, efficiency program, uh, we are now at a point where 60% of the Aboriginal homes in Nova Scotia have been retrofitted to become more energy efficient and reduce their requirements for, uh, for energy. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about tidal and, and uh, Nova Scotia has the Bay of Fundy, so tidal makes a lot of sense. We don't have any turbine manufacturers in the, in the province, so you kind of wonder why are we, in, why are we interested in, in tidal? Well, the, the, uh, there was a discussion earlier about supply chains and the importance of supply chains, and I, I think that's absolutely critical because when you look at tidal turbines, 30% of the value is in the turbine, 70% is in the supply chain, that gets the turbine into the, into the water. And, f and for us, uh, just this last year, for the first time, a, um, a, an electric cable was installed in the Minas Basin, which is in the Bay of Fundy. And if you know anything about that, that is an incredible achievement. And we will be able to say to other countries who are interested in tidal, if we can do it in the Bay of Fundy, we can do it absolutely everywhere. So we have an ocean tech sector that has been built up over the years because of the defense industry, environment industries, and the oil and gas industry. <clears throat> and that ocean tech sector is perfectly positioned to pick up the 70% of uh, tidal development. And there are countries around the world that are now beginning to look at, at tidal, tidal development. And as a government, we've decided to be experts in the regulatory processes that are required, the policy processes that are, that are required, the legal issues that are involved, so that other countries see us not just as a title expert, but a government and policy expert in how to make, how to make title work. The last example I'd like to use is, uh, is oil and gas. Uh, a, a number of years ago, the province of Nova Scotia decided to invest $15 million, given the numbers tossed around here, it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's twice my operating budget for, for a year into some geoscience work, which was to look at the entire offshore of Nova Scotia uh, together with some very good consultants and, and, and figure out what's out there. Because the industry had said, this area is too risky for us to drill. Based on that new approach to geoscience, government taking the lead rather than industry, de-risking it for industry, we now have uh, significant um, 
a total of $2 billion in drilling work committed to by Shell and BP, whereas a number of years ago, there was no new drilling happening. We have a renewed interest in our offshore, and it was based on an innovative uh, approach to geoscience taken by, taken by the government. The last thing I'd like to say is the, is the importance of, uh, of failure and allowing people to fail. And if you think it's tough to fail in the private sector, just try failing in government. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> so uh, we have to learn how to, how to, uh, how to allow governments uh, to try new things. And of course, we don't want the big failures, but, mm -hmm. but we need to be able to allow the small ones. And I think it's people like you in the room here who have to support us in our effort to do that. Thanks. Very interesting perspective. Um, Minister McQueen, we, we heard about this very interesting uh, CCEMC uh, program where you're uh, redirecting uh, revenue from, from GHG savings and, and investing it in innovation. And obviously the money is important because it drives new innovation. But how has that initiative changed uh, the way people think about uh, clean tech and, and, uh, and the traditional oil and gas sector working together uh, in energy innovation. Right, thank you. Um, you know, we've, it's quite a phenomenal program that we have with regards to the collection of uh, the technology fund and putting that, we've chosen in Alberta to do it differently versus into a general revenue to put it in a technology fund that's managed uh, arm's length from us and that can really look at uh, clean technologies but also look at how can companies work together um, to, to uh, uh, apply for grants so that they can actually see reductions in their GHGs. I think the one thing that's been very good about that program is um, although we want the outcome of the technology to be in Alberta, anyone from around the world can actually apply. So we're getting some of the best of the best ideas. And we look at now with the grand challenge, with the uh, uh, carbon grand challenge, and taking a product that people see as a negative and try to turn that into something that's positive. Um, it's quite amazing. And when you look at the number of uh, project components uh, globally that have applied for that funding to be uh, in that uh, grand challenge, it is really uh, very good because we get to see some of the brightest of the brightest. But we know that that technology we want to have implemented in Alberta as well because for us, the whole point of the technology fund is to reduce our environmental footprint as well. And so uh, we have seen it that way as well. We've also seen the collaboration uh, between uh, uh, renewable companies, between energy efficiency and people that will use this fund as well. And so as we go to green our barrels, what are other areas in, in the bioeconomy, all of those different things. Mm -hmm. So creating new economies with this fund as well. Uh, for over 49 projects funded to date, over 250 million, with a leveraging of about four to one. And so when we've talked about this in other parts of the country or globally, they're quite uh, impressed on, first of all, how did you get this fund together? Um, and how um, did you get industry to agree to this? So for us, though, the win on this fund would actually be if there was no money in that fund, because that would mean that we're actually reducing the emissions uh, that we need to. But it's one way for us to be able to bring new technology in Alberta, we know that 70% uh, just of our reductions will come through CCS. So we know that we need to invest in technology heavily uh, and we need to be having all of the global uh, thinkers about that as well. And that technology, as I said in my opening comments, will really then be technology that we can share and when we look at emerging economies as well, um, that they too will be able to be able to use. And I think that's what is so important about uh, groups like today coming together, uh, provinces and territories coming together and sharing what we're doing. Because when we look at our renewable energy strategy that we're building in Alberta to build upon what we've done with regards to before and energy efficiency, and our minister rolling that out in the renewable strategy as well. It's very important that as we go to uh, move to uh, more renewables over the coming years, but that we also spend time making sure that uh, the um, uh, barrels that we produce are, are cleaner and that they're greener, they're using less water. The intensity per barrel is, is being re reduced by about 26% right now. So the fund is there for the technology, but it's also about making sure that we're uh, are developing our resources, which we need and the globe needs, um, in a responsible manner. That's terrific. Yeah. Um, so Minister Daly, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador has the pen or is taking the lead on the technology and innovation working group of the Canadian Energy Strategy. So, so 
So what do you think's next? <laughs> well, I, you know, it's a, uh, obviously it's about next steps, but I, you know, I, I think certainly for me today, uh, th there's a clear message. Um, wherever we're going with this, we need to listen to the, uh, the experts, we need to listen to people and listen to their challenges. And obviously today was a, a, a tremendous showing of the work that's been done, but some of the issues and the challenges that's there. Um, so, so I think that's key that uh, we come to forums such as this, we provide those opportunities where you can come in and share with us what's happening. And uh, you know, there's a lot of messages here today, about, not only about the work that's been done, about the, but, but about how we're gonna grow this. How we're gonna, you know, we, I think everybody, again, I go back to, everybody has a common goal here today, but how are we gonna get there? And there's a lot of people in the room who wanna look at global markets as well and recognize there's real opportunity out there. There's real opportunity here domestically, but there's real opportunity internationally as well and, and globally, and the demand is out there. So how are we gonna frame this so that we can uh, you know, be masters of our own destiny, if you will, that we can manage both within our provinces, but certainly across the country, but at the same time, create economic okay. opportunity, solve some of our problems, um, and allow companies, allow companies to grow so that they can share in that wealth and, and create benefits for all Canadians. So, um, you know, I, I think next steps for us, and I'm sure, uh, you know, we'll talk to our colleagues, but there's a message here. We need to listen. There's great work going on, and we have to build that into whatever direction we're going in to allow opportunities. We hear things today about, uh, uh, you know, standards. We hear things about uh, uh, the Canadian brand. And uh, these are the kinds of things I think uh, we need to be cognizant of. And as governments, uh, number one, we have to listen to what's happening. Number two, we have to find a way to facilitate and allow all this stuff to happen. Mm -hmm. So let me open it for questions. This is your chance. Your mic things. over there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Scott Thurlow. I am the president of the Canadian Renewable Fuels Association. And I had to wait for Bob Blaney from CAP to leave before I could say nice things about the oil sector. Um, <laughs> So there's this underlying assumption that has permeated through many of the comments that the oil and gas sector are wearing black hats and aren't making strategic investments into the, the clean tech sector. Um, and first and foremost, I want to disavow everyone in this room of this ridiculous notion. Uh, the largest ethanol plant in the country is owned by Suncor, which, by the way, is one of the sponsors of this event. I mean, that's real clandestine operations that they've got going on, <laughs> that they're sponsoring a clean tech event, but they're not putting any investment in, into the clean tech sector. Um, Minister McQueen, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that Premier Seliger isn't still here because his province was the first one to put in a mandate for renewable diesel uh, to, to include renewable content in, in the, the diesel fuel that's used in that province. Your province has emulated that, as has British Columbia and Saskatchewan. You have a 265 million liter facility that was built in Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. Similarly, Ontario should be celebrated for the ethanol mandate. They were the first person to do that, uh, first, sorry, government in Canada to do that. As a result, there's no surprise that six ethanol plants were built in Ontario. Can you talk about the investments um, through public policy that your government has made and how that has affected the branding uh, for the oil and gas sector in Alberta? And then I'd ask uh, the deputy uh, from Nova Scotia and the minister from Newfoundland and Labrador to explain why they don't have renewable fuel mandates in their provinces. <laughs> well, thank you for the question. And I really do appreciate uh, uh, your comments with regards to the oil and gas industry. We spend a lot of time talking about the great uh, story we do have in our province of Alberta. We are blessed with abundant resources and we take the responsible energy uh, development piece very, very seriously. Suncor is one example, but also the other example, if you look at the wind uh, investments that many of our mm -hmm. oil and gas companies, they are very strategic in having many different investments in, in the oil and gas sector, but also in the renewable sector. For us, it's important to have put policies in place in order to, uh, as you mentioned, with the diesel economy, but the biodiesel economy as well, and, and um, to make sure that we put policies in place to encourage those activities and to have the blends are, are extremely important for us, and that is public policy that has to happen in order to encourage those things. 
We also look at the work that we're doing. Um, um, I moved into the ministry from environment over to energy in December, and with that, uh, Premier Redford, we had chatted about it and said this would be a very good time for us to have an associate to uh, focus on electricity and renewables. As we develop a new renewable uh, strategy in Alberta and in collaboration with the environment on the energy efficiency strategy, that we actually take a look at this and what can we do in a marketplace, leaving um, a very strong market like we do in the electricity sec sector in Alberta marketplace, but there's lots of room for renew renewables and looking at those and what policy uh, levers can we use for that. Uh, we have many of them, we'll continue to have those as we look at that. But we look at it from, uh, which may be different than others, but we look at it really within the market system that we operate under. How do you then integrate renewables? Um, how do you bring energy efficiency? All of those things. And we've been doing many of those for years. But to be able to look at, get again at that and, and bring on the strategy. Um, and you know, I, I just, I think about uh, uh, the amount of uh, investment of time and resources that the oil and gas industry as well uh, puts uh, with uh, folks like Alberta Innovates, with our universities, with Climate Change Emissions Management Corp, all of these organizations that we have collectively, multi, multi million dollars in investment in uh, new technologies as we are, are greening our barrels and we're greening our economy, knowing that uh, we're, we're, we are very blessed and we speak about that a lot in Alberta with the resources we have, just like other provinces are with resources you have. When we look as we phasing out uh, with the new uh, regulations, uh, federal regulations of coal and moving to more gas uh, fired, a, a cleaner source. So there's many uh, opportunities and the stories are so great uh, in our province and across the nation. And we talk about them a lot. Sometimes we talk, think we talk too much about them, um, but I don't think we can all collectively talk enough about them because there's so many good stories in our sectors across this nation and we just need to get those stories out. And so we were having a conversation last night and I think part of that it is each of us telling uh, the good news about each other's provinces and start to share that and start to share uh, the good stories. That doesn't mean that we can't do better and should not do better because we believe in that too, but we should really start to celebrate what we are doing as provinces, territories, and a nation because what Canada is doing is showing real leadership through, through all of us um, on the work that we're doing while being global suppliers of energy from all sources. So thank you. Comments from the others on enabling <laughs> policy frameworks ahead, for. Uh, uh, um, well, we're we're uh, I guess we're the bad guy in this, um, <laughs> and and the absence of that in in the Canadian market, not having Nova Scotia on board, has had a huge impact given the size of our market. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that that works two ways, unfortunately for us. Yeah. But uh, I, th I think there are a number of factors. One is that is that uh, we didn't see uh, we didn't see a significant benefit to us because we didn't have the industry that was going to produce uh, the the bio content. Uh, we had a refinery that was on the edge uh, and has now gone under. So maybe we'll re-enter the conversation. Uh, and we also have invested in the last couple of years in in a research facility in Liverpool, Nova Scotia which is looking at biofuels from uh, forest biomass. So we're, we're kind of moving in the right direction there. I think, uh, you know, again, I, I won't sit here and explain to you why, I guess, and, uh, but, but I, I, I know what we're seeing is, is kind of a transformation in the province. Uh, we, we're starting to see it over the last three or four years particularly, but we're, you know, we're, we're moving in a direction where we want to take our non-renewables and turn into renewables. And that's been a focus and, and a mantra, I guess, of where we're trying to develop our resources. But within that, inherently as well, whether it's in the forest industry, uh, whether it's in our refining industry, uh, there's, there's many challenges. But more and more, we're starting to see, and again, a lot of things talked about today about some of the smaller companies, the smaller focus. Uh, we talked about off-grid. We talked about some of these isolated and remote communities. How do we find some ways in which we can get in there and, and create some opportunities and be able to take advantage of uh, the full benefits of what's happening in our oil and gas sector, which has been tremendous for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. But, but we're starting to see, and I guess you know, the industry has evolved over the last 10 to 15 years. More and more now we're starting to see people looking at new ideas, new opportunities to be able to create smaller renewable opportunities as well. Can I just add something? Yes. That? 
I, I kind of made light of uh, Nova Scotia's role in the Canadian market. Uh, and it's an, it's an important point because when we're looking at things like efficiency standards for appliances, what, Alber what Alberta and Ontario and Quebec do is very important for us because for Nova Scotia to stick up its hand and say, uh, we insist on this standard mm -hmm. of efficiency in appliances uh, is like blowing into a hurricane. It doesn't have much impact. So uh, we've spent a lot of time working with the other provinces uh, to, to try and develop national standards uh, because if we have Alberta and Ontario and Quebec on side, it, it will be easier to put those standards into effect. Another question. I, maybe I'll, I'll lob one over. Obviously, in many sectors, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises are um, kind of the, uh, the hot furnaces of, of the innovation process. And I think in Ontario, we've been uh, extremely fortunate that the government has really recognized that and has supported a network um, that can, can regionally build capacity uh, to fuel those companies and with this uh, advanced energy center we're obviously taking the next leap to make sure they get into international markets. How do you think about the role of SMEs and how do you tether them to the, the very large uh, resource-based infrastructure that's, that's so dominant in, in uh, your provinces? If we could just make a, a brief comment. The, uh, and I'll give you an example, uh, I guess from a government perspective and our views in terms of the investments as, as you know, we've gone from $10 million to probably $140, $150 million over the last number of years in investment supports for small and medium-sized business and the tremendous computer, uh, contribution that they make to the province. But to give you an example, in our oil and gas sector, for example, we have 500, just over 500 supply and service businesses in our province. And that's what's driving our economy. That's the underlying. And, and, and the same thing is starting to happen in our energy sector is there's more and more research, there's more and more investment, there's more and more uh, opportunities being created. And as they're looking not only within our province, but certainly now with the, uh, the opportunities that we have in terms of the, the you know, connecting into the North American grid, it, it, people have got a different perspective. And they're looking at these opportunities and looking at opportunities globally. So it's, uh, it's been you know, uh, tremendous for our province. We've seen tremendous examples of the contributions they're making, and with over 500 supply and service companies uh, in, a, in a province of a half a million people, uh, I think it certainly right. demonstrates a commitment and demonstrates, obviously, the success that they're, they're having in our province. Mm -hmm. Minister? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and you know, what we really look at in Alberta is creating an environment uh, for all business, quite frankly, to be able to grow and, and, and flourish and prosper, to, cre to really create that through a really sound uh, taxation system so that it is a, a place that you can do business. It's a place that's really open and has a business mind, and it's a place that has a, a very good, solid uh, uh, tax rate for businesses. I think that's first and foremost and certainly a principle that Alberta really has because having a business background myself, uh, for a number of years, that to me uh, was one of the most important things, that this is a place that is not overtaxed so that you actually can grow uh, businesses. We look in Alberta in, in the energy sector or in any of the sectors, if you look at the number of, of small businesses that spin off and, and then become large corporations, especially in the oil and gas industry, when you've got juniors that come and they have a place that has a, a good solid uh, uh, investment uh, in a province like Alberta, it really helps them to grow. Now, when we have areas uh, that people want to uh, um, be able to um, have ideas and be able to take those ideas to places where they can do demonstration and then get to commercialization, that's really important. And that's when we work with our partners, whether they be uh, through universities, through Innovates, all of those different places, because there is some help that we can do. And we do invest uh, millions of dollars in that area too to help ideas uh, to be get to the demonstration and the commercialization as well. And I, I think that's where we really look at it. But it really is market driven and how do we help businesses to help themselves too because that's how uh, they really do become sustainable. But the innovation and the technology piece is so important for us to be able to help them to know where to go to, to access uh, partnerships like that to grow their business. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just comment, I can't compete with the Alberta tax structure, unfortunately. Uh, I'm not sure we could afford to, but I don't want to get into finance policy. Uh, I, I think in terms of uh, what we try to do for our um, small businesses involved in the energy sector 
is to support their efforts to market and we, we also encourage them to be competitive. So we have tried to stay away from policies that protect uh, companies. Uh, first of all, our market isn't that big, but even so, we've, we've said in our oil and gas sector, we want our companies to be competitive uh, on a world basis. And when we went through a decline in our offshore, uh, those companies were then able to compete globally and to get business globally which if they'd been protected by our policies, they would not have been able to do that. So that, that competitiveness is always, very, is always very important. And if we're talking about s selling clean tech around the world, uh, we do have to be competitive. One more question. Yes, sir. There you go. Thank you very much for, for this session. I was wondering, as a final question, to ask what success would look like since we're talking about the Canadian energy strategy. If you project to the future, and I know that it's early days, uh, but what would success look like if this Canadian energy strategy were to take hold in the future? What a great closing question. Who would like to go first? I, I think, Eddie, I think, I think it already has taken hold, and I think today is a testament, and it's the start of that. The premiers uh, have done an outstanding job across the nation um, bringing forward the ideas, getting working groups that I know uh, Manitoba, Newfoundland, Labrador, and, and Alberta are leading in some of those areas in different areas, uh, yourself in the technology, us with regards to market access and those things. But I think success really has started. Um, because the conversa conversation has started and now we're working on whether they be national projects uh, for our provinces and territories or on regional projects as we have uh, different projects that we work uh, with different uh, provinces one or two at a time. I think success is that we continue to do this and that we continue to work together as uh, Premier Wynn said uh, earlier today in the press conference. Uh, the more strength, and we all say this, the more strength we do and work together as provinces and territories, uh, the stronger we all are as a nation, and I think that's a success. I think when we continue to look to, at uh, and sharing ideas, especially on the innovation and technology piece and, and learning from each other because there's so much we can learn from each other, and having that door open and the conversation open um, and being able to really talk about that, I think that's where we're going to see um, the continued success. But I don't think the Canadian energy strategy is ever done. I think it's something that will always go and it will grow. And by working together like this, making sure that it's not just about elected folks, but that we're engaging in groups like this um, and that it really becomes, uh, for all Canadians, a strategy that they see that they're part of, that this is something for them too, not just as elected folks or, or our, our deputies and our government employees, but that it is truly something that Canadians feel, our provinces feel, and our people and our citizens feel that they're connected to and that they have a, a way to help uh, promote as well. Terrific. Deputy Minister? I, I, I think that's an excellent summary. I don't want to take away from it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think when this is done, we, we as government, uh, we, we need to be able to facilitate. We need to be able to allow things to happen, not be an impediment. We need to, at the end of all this, to ensure that by listening and by coming up with the the, the platforms and the right policies here in the right direction to ensure that whether you're in an urban area or a rural area, whether you're on the grid or you're off the grid, whether you're a corporation or a small business, that we need to make sure that we find a way, and some of the comments that was made today, is that we kind of capture the tremendous potential that's there in the energy sector. Whether ever we're going to do that, I think the strategy needs to facilitate that and not be an impediment to allow all of you and, and the tremendous work that you're doing, and, and for us as politicians, uh, you know, and I go back to a comment that's been made today, you know, this is about the customer. For us, you know, we represent the customer, and many of you represent the customers. So we can meet those customers' needs as well as address that in our full strategy for na nationwide, we have a tremendous focus on energy, and I, I certainly echo the comments that this is not done. I think we need to continue to focus on energy focus on the opportunities, and I think we'll be a much better country because of it. Thank you. Terrific.